Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program that reads the whole Bible in one year. We start in Genesis and we travel all the way through to Revelation. It is exciting. And I want to tell you that Corey helps us to listen and do this. Corey, what's up today? Today we are going to be focusing in on an ancient king that God told Elijah about. All right, very good. And uh, what did you study today? Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about Elijah wrapping his face with his mantle. That is amazing because the truth is that that mantle was received by Elijah or Elisha. Very interesting. Ryan, what's up? Well, today in our study on the UFO phenomenon, we're talking about the possibility of long distance and high speed space travel. Does physics allow it? All right, very good. And later on in the program, a still small voice. What is going on? We're talking about the great prophet. Stay there as we study. Now, covered in our reading today, uh, the Lord tells Elijah that he needs to go anoint Hazael, this man Hazael, as king over Aram or Aram. Now, you and I are going to be focusing in on Hazael because it turns out he's known in history outside of the Bible, and it's a quite interesting history as well. Take a look. The historical figure of Hazael, usurper king of Aram, who ruled from 842 to 800 BC, appears in the Bible many times. First, as an army commander speaking with Elijah in 1 Kings 19, and then as an enemy king opposing Israel and Judah in 2 Kings 8 to 13 and 2 Chronicles 22. So great was Hazael's attack and success against God's people that 50 years later, the prophet Amos would use his name in his prophecies against Aram. Like many influential people in the Bible, evidence for Hazael can also be found outside of the scriptures. Hazael is mentioned in the Assyrian records of King Shalmaneser III, unearthed in 1903, in which Hazael is called a usurper, the son of a nobody, matching the Bible's description. One of the most famous artifacts in biblical archaeology was likely commissioned by Hazael himself. Today, we call it the Tel Dan Stella, after the city, Dan, in which it was found between 1993 and 94. The Stella claims victory for Hazael over Israel and the house of David. It names King Joram and Ahaziah as killed by him. In the scriptures, Joram and Ahaziah are actually killed by Jehu, an Israelite commander, in the aftermath of skirmishes with Hazael. But not surprisingly, here on his victory Stella, Hazael took full credit. There have also been finds in modern-day Syria that relate to Hazael. Found within the occupied territory of Assyria were ivory carvings believed to have come as booty from Hazael's Damascus palace. Two of them are decorative carvings with a dedication inscription to Hazael. Another is of a standing figure that researchers believe to be a portrait of Hazael. Now, the lifetime of Elijah is very, very interesting, and I'm sure you've noticed as you've been reading these few chapters with us, and quite a lot of time is dedicated uh, to Elijah. Now, um, it's different from the other prophets because there's not very many um, uh, of the other prophets from the time period of the kings that are given this attention in the book of Kings and Chronicles. Uh, a lot of uh, some of the major prophets have uh, their own writings that show up later on in the canon of scripture, like Isaiah and Jeremiah. But a lot of attention here is given to Elijah. Now, I find that really interesting, especially when it's related to New Testament studies, because we get into the New Testament and we see Elijah as, um, and perhaps it's because uh, he is one of the most talked about prophets, uh, his exploits, not just his prophecies, not many of his prophecies are recorded, but a lot of his life is recorded, what he did very practically, the miracles that God performed 
performed through him, he serves as sort of an, an indicator for us of what it looked like to be a prophet of God, what it looked like to be uh, full of the Holy Spirit in the time period of the Old Testament. So when we get to the New Testament and we see Jesus performing miracles that sound a lot like Elijah, but going beyond Elijah, we begin to realize how amazing this must have seemed uh, to, the, to the Jewish people of that day. Even in Acts, we see Peter and Paul mimicking some of the miracles of Elijah. God's people, those called by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes feel he doesn't do enough. They want God to personally beat their enemies up right down to the ground, but he doesn't. Is this a failure of the Lord God Almighty? I mean, is God afraid of the people and the trouble that they will cause? I mean, why not show himself and take over as an all-powerful God should? Well, if you've ever inquired, congratulations you're normal. Why doesn't God show himself? We are reminded God shows himself through us as we, his witnesses, share the work of Jesus Christ. When God did not show up after the Baal prophets died on Mount Carmel, well, the prophet Elijah could not understand why. First Kings 19, verses 1 through 13. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 13.
Reading the Bible is so exciting, and I, I love when Janice does that so we can understand what God is saying. Get your Bible guide out in your Bible. If you don't have it, go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's www.biblediscoverytv.com and make an offering there and you can be a part of this. Very important, very important. Now, as we think this through, as we begin to understand the changes in leadership and everything going on, we look at works of faith. When we look at works of faith, the question that I have to ask is actually not a question, it's a statement. A still, small voice. A still, small voice. I love that because that's God's voice. You say, well, God, are you talking about God Almighty? Yes, I'm talking a still, small voice. God can do everything, and we learned that today. We're reading 1 Kings 17 to 19. This is amazing. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 to 13. Now, it is important that we get into this so we understand what God is saying. Father, help us today to understand this scripture. Listen carefully to 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now, that's fascinating. Also, how he had executed, he had executed all the prophets with the sword. That's the Baal prophets. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. <laughs> a contract on his life, interesting. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. What, are you serious? And when he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. Just kill me, Lord. He said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. This is amazing. Elijah felt like a failure you got to be kidding me. After all of that work at Mount Carmel, Elijah felt like a failure because Jezebel's threat. We must know that our feelings will betray us. They will. We must trust God, not our feelings. So many people today are sensuous Christians. You know, their, their life is depending upon how they feel. No, I feel good. My life is good. My Christian life is good. I feel good. Then the next day we don't feel good. I don't feel good. My Christian life is not good. My good. Hold on a minute because I can feel good to eat some pizza and it's bad pizza. And the next thing I know, I don't feel good. You see, feelings change, beloved, but facts do not change. Faith produces facts that do not change. Keep that in mind because as we study the scripture, we need to understand. Now, Elijah was a person who did not really understand that. He knew drama. He knew all of the things. And at Mount Carmel, he did many things that were amazing. But now he's running away from Jezebel because she threatened him? Fascinating. All right, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 to 8. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake and baked on coals and, and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, and he ate, and he drank. And he went in strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, this is interesting because Elijah went to Horeb, that is God's mountain, where Moses was given the law. This is fascinating. He felt he could die there, but he was wrong. He was wrong. Beloved, we must trust God and his word. We must not trust ourselves. You know, there's many times in my life when I have felt, well, I know I know God, I know how he's going to do this. And I learned that I don't know God. I don't know how he's going to do that because he did something different. And I'm talking to you. And if you're somebody who doesn't know God, then come to know Jesus Christ because he will, in fact, show you his ways and teach you his paths. They are different than this world. It's great. Citizens of heaven, 
And this is Elijah, a man of God, having these problems. And here's what God does to him. Verse 9 of chapter 19 says, And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. Now listen carefully. And behold, take note, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, and for the children of Israel, I've forsaken, and, and I have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And then he said, go out and stand in the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Boy, this is, this is an amazing statement. You see, sometimes God's voice is not what we expect it to be. It's not. God speaks so that people clearly recognize him. Let me ask you this question. Very important question. If you know the God of the universe is going to speak to you, you know, you get ready you go out and you're on a mountain and you're going to just stand there and wait for the big to come in, you know, going to talk to me. Nope. God speaks to us like we can hear him. God knows how to speak to us. You see, God can speak to us anywhere. God may be speaking to you right now through your conscience. You've aligned yourself with God and your conscience speaks to you, but you've been ignoring it. God may speak to you in many ways, but let me tell you something. God always speaks. God talks. And so we need to listen to the Lord. When Elijah, the great dramatic prophet of his time, misunderstood the voice of God, we can misunderstand the voice of God today. We need to listen to the Bible and to the Word of God in our hearts. We need to know Jesus Christ, speak to me in my heart today and right now. Next time on Quick Study, we'll continue to go through these books and learn more about the kings who come into play. But right now, here's Ryan. Ryan? Well, as I mentioned last Tuesday, we're examining closely the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Now, this is the idea that extraterrestrials are visiting the Earth from distant worlds. Now, if indeed ETs are visiting Earth from all across the galaxy and beyond, then certainly they would have to travel very far, very fast through space. No problem, right? Wrong. The extraterrestrial hypothesis posits that advanced alien civilizations from all across the universe are visiting the Earth. However, a major problem with this theory 
is that these alleged ETs would actually need to break the laws of physics to do it. Indeed, consider a hypothetical spaceship that could travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, and the fastest speed possible, according to Einstein's theory of special relativity. Upon departure from the Earth, this lightspeed ship would circle the Earth seven times in one second. It would pass the Moon in two seconds and Mars in four minutes. At five hours, it would pass Pluto, and then four years later, it would arrive at Proxima Centauri, the closest star outside of our solar system. Traversing our own galaxy at light speed would take about 100,000 years, and then upon exiting the Milky Way, we would need to travel for approximately 2,300,000 years in order to reach our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda. To reach the next closest galaxy would take 20 million years. Yet even after this extremely long journey, there are still countless unvisited far-off places in the universe. Indeed, the universe is so immense that even with all of the advanced technology we currently possess, we still cannot see its end. Still, according to the laws of nature, even propelling a ship at light speed would be extremely out of the reach of reality. As one UFO skeptic argues, Einstein theorized that the maximum speed possible would be c, that is, the speed of light. This is because as our speed increases, our mass increases, until at c, our mass becomes infinite. Most people think that because objects become weightless in space, they would be easy to propel. But this is incorrect. Even in space, the more mass an object has, the more energy you need to propel it. In fact, to propel an object that weighs only one pound to a velocity 50% the speed of light would require an energy source equal to the energy of 98 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. Interestingly, to propel NASA's space shuttle to 90% of the speed of light would take 351 years of combined energy from every single energy facility in the United States of America. This is equal to 73 million atomic bombs. Another problem is that it would require the same amount of energy to stop the ship as it would to propel it. Additionally, if the ship is making a return trip, then we would need the energy to speed it up and slow it down again. And at the best speed of the Apollo craft, which took three days to get to the moon, it would take 870,000 years just to reach Proxima Centauri. Yet even if there were some way past this energy dilemma, there are other problems to be overcome. Isn't this interesting? Though many believe that extraterrestrials are making regular visits to the Earth, science and physics say that this is not possible. Also interesting is the fact that these beings also proclaim themselves to be extraterrestrials from the distant reaches of space. Perhaps then these beings are not what they confess to be. Now, maybe some of you watching think that I'm jumping to conclusions because perhaps this light speed problem could be overcome. Well, the fact is that even if this problem could be overcome, many more problems are created. Now, this is our topic next Tuesday. That is amazing, Ryan. You listen to this and you begin to understand things. And th the problem is it takes the fun out of it for a lot of individuals who right. are really into this sort of thing. I used to be into this kind of thing myself. And uh, it really takes the personal entertainment out of it, it doesn't does. it? Well, it separates the science fact from science fiction, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's yeah. just the, the reality, you know? And it's, it's yeah. hard to tell the difference these days because science fiction, of course, is well, the mean, most popular genre. Star Trek and Star Wars yeah, and every alien it, right? and everybody else, but yeah. not the case in reality. Right. Interesting. What did you study today? Well, we're looking at Elijah, and he has gone to the mountain to meet with God. And we hear that there was a strong wind, but God wasn't in the strong wind. Then we heard there was an earthquake and God wasn't in the earthquake. Then there was a fire. God wasn't in the fire, but there was a still small voice. And verse 13 says, so it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Now you could see him wrapping his face in the mantle because of the the previous things that have happened, but now it's a still small voice. But what we need to realize is wrapping your face in the mantle was a sign of reverence in the presence of God. And we have a couple of other times that we can see that in the scripture. We can see that demonstrated with Moses when God appeared to him in the burning bush. The scripture says that he hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God, rightly so. And also, so too, in the um, vision 
seen by Isaiah in his temple vision. We read about that in Isaiah 6 verse 2. We read about the seraphim and they also, with their two of their wings, cover their faces. So just, just something to draw attention to, you know, why he would he would do that in that situation. You know, I mean, it's, it's really important to understand this when the seraphim did that. And how that, and God says things along the way through the whole Bible. Mm-hmm. Says to things, you know, like Moses, he says, take off your sandals for your right. feet. Right, on holy yeah. ground. And, and then he says the same thing to Joshua. Exactly. Then he says, mm-hmm. he, he just says these things. And mm-hmm. the prophets fall down in the presence of God. Like they're dead. Like they're dead. God has to powerful. touch them. Very That's powerful. powerful stuff. <laughs> God has to touch them before they get up. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Well, we're running short on time, but I need to tell people quickly that the Bible guide is available for you. If you want it, we'll send it to you, send an offering in any amount. The offerings are very important. And uh, just to let you know, that's how we're supported by people who decide to give. And so we're not gonna tell you, (laughs) I mean, you can give whatever you want, but I don't know how much you wanna give. It's up to you and God. We trust the work of the Holy Spirit in you when you pray about it. Pray about giving an offering, and if you can, then give an offering, and we'll send you a Bible guide. It's very, very important. Also remember that the reason we do this program is because Jesus Christ has changed our lives. He's changed us radically. You know, I I say this all the time. 40 years ago, I came to know God, and there's been a lot of problems in that relationship since, and all of them have been my problem. My problem, because God has been perfect all the way and he's worked it out. Let me tell you something, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he did die, there's more evidence for that than anything else in history pretty much, and he died on the cross, but he rose again. Initially seen by over 500 men that that he paid the price for sin, and he paid the cost for sin, and he gave us the ability to have everlasting life, Mm -hmm. everlasting life. So when you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe in you, help me. He does something miraculous. He comes in and changes your life completely and totally redesigns it. Do that today. 